HCAM News is supported by our viewers and by Hopkinton Drug, located in this historic New England town since 1954. They are a multifaceted store dedicated to providing clients with an array of health care options. And by Webster First Federal Credit Union, providing financial products with attentive customer service to the local families and businesses of Hopkinton. Visit us at WebsterFirst.com. And welcome to HCAM News, Tom Nappy at the Anchor Desk to fill you in with the latest happenings in Hopkinton. On this edition of HCAM News, Educate Hopkinton hosted a public forum regarding town growth and development. Some Blackstone Valley Tech students showed off an emergency escape system to the Hopkinton Fire Department. And we have scenes from the Hopkinton High School Art Show at the Center for the Arts. But first, the Board of Selectmen recognized Hopkinton's Conservation Administrator, Don McAdam, for receiving the State Award for Conservation Administrator of the Year. Don is so passionate about his role as a conservation agent. Uh, I think him and I always compete as to who is going to switch off the lights in the building. So he's dedicated, he's passionate, and he's always present. Uh, and also, secondly, uh, conservation, in most cases, generates tension and conflict and strong debate. I can assure you that Don's interactions with the public, be it residents, business people, are always pleasant. Mm -hmm. I have not had a single issue regarding conservation that has been escalated to the town manager's office in for nine years. And so tonight, the Board of Selectmen will, will recognize John McAdam, the Conservation Administrator. Uh, he received the Conservation Administrator of the Year Award from the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions on March 3rd, 2018. Uh, the MACC noted that Don has consistently demonstrated professionalism and patience and takes the extra time to help applicants understand the work of the commission and to assist applicants with the process. Don's colleagues and Conservation Commission members noted that he goes above and beyond on a regular basis, and they greatly appreciate everything he does for the Commission and for Community Hopkinton. And the Chair of the Conservation Commission is here tonight, uh, in case he has any words to share. Uh, on behalf of the Conservation Commission, uh, you know, we want to express our gratitude to Don, and I echo uh, Mr. Colombo's uh, comments. Uh, this is certainly an award that is well deserved for Don. Um, I've worked with him for a long time now, uh, close to I think 16 or 17 years, and Don consistently um, is professional. He's enthusiastic. Um, his knowledge of the regulations um, with the Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw really is what helps our commission to run efficiently and effectively. And I can't uh, thank, him, thank him enough because he really um, allows us to do our job very well and for us to come to the meetings prepared. So, Don, thank you and congratulations. Thanks, Jeff. Thank Excellent. you, board, for taking the time to recognize me. I know you got a busy schedule. Thank you very much. Oh, we're not done. Oh, we're not done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a couple. You've done a great job protecting our community and protecting our natural resources but you've also done a great job navigating the process and staying within the law to make sure that everybody gets a fair look and shake at how things play out. So I congratulate you for that. I know it's not easy, and uh, I think you've done a, done a fantastic job, and I hope you will continue to do a fantastic job for another 18 years. You know, I, I echo what everybody said, you know, and, and to what uh, Mrs. Sestari said, you know, we're so lucky, you know, to be on, on, on our, all these volunteer boards, to, to have the professionals in place. You know, Elaine went for all, all the years on, on planning board and Zach keeping everything running and you on the um, on the uh, conservation commission. Just like, just, just like uh, people said before, going, up, going uh, to a conservation commission usually means 
Oh, you can read it too. It's going through hell. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's always fair. I've been on both sides with, uh, with CONCOM, and it's, it's always fair. Nobody feels as though um, that uh, they had a, any, any kind of a bad taste in the mouth when they left. And really, thanks for everything that you've done. Thanks for being with us. Sorry you lost so much hair being with us. <laughs> but, uh, Happened off the best of us. <laughs> you know. Oh, man. <laughs> but uh, you know, hopefully the, the, the next uh, 20 years are, are good to you and you're good to us. So thanks so much. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, 7 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This past week, Educate Hopkinton hosted a public forum to talk about the growth and development throughout town. Here's a look. Educate Hopkinton hosted a public forum regarding town growth and development. EHOP President Nanda Barker Hook started off by presenting some of the facts about town growth. By population growth, Hopkinton is ranked among the state's most rapidly growing towns for more than 20 years. Um, and this slide is showing our population growth over time from all the way back to 1930. Um, you can see this particular uptick in 1990 was quite dramatic in the 90s. And it's actually not um, as dramatic at, at this point compared to the 90s. Um, our current population, this was based on information from the clerk's office at the end of uh, 2017, was just under 17,000 people. And that number actually exceeds the projection that the Massachusetts um, Area Planning Council Council was projecting for 2020. Our town, in terms of population, has grown by 13.5 percent since 2010. And there's a lot in the works. There's many more um, units to be added, housing developments. Um, so this is just a quick list of some of them that are in the pipeline. 662 units are in the pipeline, soon to have um, occupancy permits. This number is sort of fluid. It seems like it's always growing. So uh, this is 92 new students have enrolled in our schools since September 2017. And that's the number that was given to us by the superintendent's office February 27th. Town manager Norman Kumalo spoke on the reasoning behind the recent tax increases. I think what we're seeing is a confluence of several factors. Number one, the local economy. And in assessing the local economy, I also include the growth in town. Secondly, the strategic decisions that this town has carefully made in the past, making wonderful investments, for example, in our new elementary school, the Marathon School, uh, the DPW facility, uh, as well as the renovated library. And thirdly, part of the increase that we're seeing in the budget is a result of <coughs> a careful and thoughtful assessment of emerging and changing needs in the community. The school committee, board of selectmen, fire department, each and every one of these departments has gone through a very careful assessment of these needs. They do change. And last but not least, we may all do this work. Review the economy. Review the strategic decisions made in the past. Look at the emerging trends. There are needs that we cannot anticipate with all that planning. Hopkinton Director of Operations Elaine Lazarus spoke about growth and development trends so I think laying that planning groundwork by those people who were here in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, really put that into motion, and that was a good thing. And as time went along, those bylaws were tweaked and updated as new people came in and there were new ideas and new challenges. One of the other things um, about growth and development was during this t same time period, there was a real desire to grow the commercial base along with the residential there was a desire to keep that balance and a realization that without the commercial building along with the residential, that the burden on the residential taxpayers would become too 
And so during this time period, there was also a great deal of development along South Street, uh, R&D facilities and EMC, and that helped to balance the residential growth at the same time, and that has continued to grow as well. Hopkinton Planning Board Chairman John Ferrari spoke about some of the most recent housing trends in town. I think where we're going is so much of the town growth that you're seeing in these numbers, especially since 2010, or the uh, garden apartment, which are not the, what we may think of as garden apartments, multifamily uh, townhouses that, you know, the, 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 what's going on around town now. With the changes in the bylaws that we instituted, that is going away as long as we are above the 10% number for affordable housing. So if you don't remember, uh, we put a restriction on it at town meeting about two years ago. A year ago? Uh, seems so long ago. So development is now going to come mostly on the residential side from single family housing. What is happening now, which we're beginning to see a little bit of, is maybe some sites that we thought were not developable because they didn't have street access. I think if, if the housing market continues to increase, you're going to see developers looking at a parcel, maybe buying the street frontage with a house, tearing it down to give them the ability to put a road through. So you might start seeing stuff like that. But I think the large amount of growth that we're seeing is, is not going to increase based on the change we made in the Garden Department regulations. To view the full EHA Public Forum, head over to our website, hcam.tv, or youtube.com slash hcamtv. Coming up next on HCAM News, some high school students showed off an escape system to the Hopkinton Fire Department. We'll take you to the Hopkinton High School Art Show at the Center for the Arts, and Matt Clark has our HCAM Insider, plus a whole lot more ahead on HCAM News. Stay tuned. HCAM programming is supported by our viewers, thank you, and by Golden Pond Assisted Living, honoring resident choice, dignity, and independence. Our health and wellness focus keeps residents active. Golden Pond, state-of-the-art senior housing and health care services. Welcome back to HCAM News. Three Blackstone Valley Tech students designed a system called Easy Escape, the goal of the system is to help people escape a large building in the event of an emergency. Here's a look. Three students from Blackstone Valley Tech High School visited the Hopkinton Fire Department to show off their Easy Escape system. So this is Easy Escape, which is a new fire evacuation and detection system. So basically, instead of finding the fastest way out of the building, it finds the safest way out of the building. So. For example, if there's a fire in between you and an exit that is the fastest way out, it's going to tell you to not go that way and go a different way that is safer. The system is meant to help evacuate buildings during emergencies. Next step after this demonstration is to get input from the fire department here in Hopkinton, find out what changes we need to make to this design in order to have the best and most efficient system for saving people in the event of a fire. The students will be entering the design into the Skills USA competition. Skills USA is a technical competition for technical students, and so there's competitions ranging from uh, the fields of plumbing to electrical, anywhere to engineering technology or principles of engineering. This specific design will be enrolled in the um, engineering technology competition the next month. Next month, excuse me at Marlboro. Uh, basically, it is a fire detection and evacuation system that finds the safest way out and not the fastest way out. So, for example, this classroom right here, if they want to, uh, under normal circumstances, they would go out the door and around to this exit. But if this fire is on, they're going to come around the corner and they're going to run into the fire and they're going to be, you know, in big trouble. But, and you, as you can see right now, the arrows are guiding them down away from the fire so that they can escape to the safest exit and not the fastest exit, right? So this system also allows for numerous inputs, so it can account for multiple locations or fires. So if both of these fires were on, it wouldn't allow any of these to light up, and it would put indicators in both of these rooms saying there's no traditional way of exit, either find an alternative, alternative exit through a window or a side classroom door, or wait to be rescued. 
when these lights get indicated, there would be a panel on the side of the building where the fire fighters can go to. And the existing panel already, it would have extra information saying these two rooms are priority, they're trapped, they're high priority, go see these rooms first. And then if there's a fault in the system, if maybe a wire burns off, which is unlikely, but if that happens, then it would have a null reading in the system and if you don't flip it, it would uh, trigger a failsafe, which would just act as a regular fire alarm. Really? I feel like a while ago, it was just a little side project for school. Kevin actually came up with the idea as his dad as an inspiration, and then it just sort of took off from there, and we're taking it to Skills USA. The students are hoping to take their design to the next level. Uh, if we go to college, uh, WPI has a fire prevention engineering program, and uh, they might want to buy this from us for because we're planning to get all the patents together, so that could be an option. Um, and then we also have this like fail-safe system. So if the building is on fire and the light gets disconnected from the computer that is doing it, it they start to flash, saying that it's just you have to you can't trust the arrows. Use your head. Yes. Time for common sense. Yes. Survival like, mode. Good. Right. So yeah. right now in the model, the fail-safe flashing is blue. However, if it would actually be installed into a building, it wouldn't be the arrows themselves that light up. There would be this little module, this mm -hmm. circle that's along with the arrows, and it would be strobing white, just mm -hmm. like the fire alarms. I'm pretty impressed. Uh, Kevin had talked to me about the concept of this uh, escape safety and having an alternative instead of just the nearest exit. And uh, I'm envisioning him even having some other applications with this with uh, other than just fires. There's other emergencies we face in these buildings and uh, n being directed to the uh, safest access, which is maybe not the closest access, has a lot of applications, so I'm pretty impressed. And uh, I don't know if Kevin said in his introduction, but uh, he's the son of one of my firefighters, and uh, we've seen his talent for a few years now, so it's impressive to see it applied to the fire service and some of the stuff that our community faces, so. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, certainly a lot of applications that this could entail for uh, getting out of a building safely, um, and there's a lot of different pathways this could go. In addition to being used to escape a building in the event of a fire, the design also has potential to be used for other situations, such as an active shooter. <laughs> yeah, so we could put gunshot detectors in the ceiling and use that facial recognition uh, software. To well, actually, even the way even the way it is right now, I think that you could do the same thing. It's just like you, we know the shooter is yeah, so is can, there to be, so avoid yeah. yeah. It can easily be done with manual inputs from school administrators. Right. It's also easily adaptable to industrial environments, say poison gas detectors. So explain your theory. I don't want to say the name. I always the logic. The name. Yes, yeah. the boolean. So it's boolean. all it's all based on <laughs> boolean logic. So just true or false. So the electronics and the software behind it stay relatively the same, regardless of the purpose of the system. There would just be changes to the hardware mostly. This past week, the Hopkinton Center for the Arts hosted the always anticipated Hopkinton High School Honors Art Show. Here's a look at some of the great work. Um, so there are 13 students in the show, which is pretty nice, and it's a pretty big variety of um, different uh, artists of different mediums, which is kind of cool. A lot of times it's predominantly, uh, well, it's still predominantly two-dimensional artists, but as our, our department is sort of shifting and becoming more three-dimensional, it's nice to see some models and um, some mold making. Uh, I have nine pieces on display today, and I'm really influenced by negative space, so I think it's really interesting. Um, the negative space around people, so also like taking the shadow around someone. I have a piece over there where it's my cross country team all huddled up together, and I cut out like the sky basically in like the photo, and I painted just the face, like the shadows around the faces. And I, I really think that's interesting and something cool to explore. So, uh, how many pieces of work do you have on display here today? I have six. How long have you been doing art for? Um, I've been doing seriously for like about four years, but I. Like even from before I could talk, I, my parents told me stories about how I would draw on the walls with my sisters and stuff like that. 
and my older sister was always a big inspiration, always pushing me to do art, so I've been doing it for a while. Um, I do photography advanced with um, Julia Underdawn, Patrick Webb, um, Mr. Worrell's class. All right, and uh, how long have you been interested in photography? Um, I've been interested in photography like since like the eighth grade. My sister like got a like, camera, like a DSLR, and like I really liked it, but I never had the chance to like take any photos because I didn't like know how the camera worked. And I took photography last year, and I like learned what an exposure is and all that type of stuff. And like I've really grown to love it. Um, and, and one interesting thing of note in this show, I think, is. Uh, several of the students have done this sort of uh, old analog and new digital kind of mix. Some of the students are shooting film, digitizing the negatives, and printing digitally, and that, that's really cool. Um, so I have about three pieces, and they're all film photography, because that's mainly what I've been dealing with the past couple of years. So I don't know if there is one of mine. And uh, what motivated uh, your work? Um, a lot of my motivation is just by how I feel like people can get a lot out of a certain piece of photography and how photography can really be interpreted on its own based on just the person viewing it and I feel like that is a really inspiring thing to me. Um, I have three pieces up in total, this one and that one and one over there. Excellent. How long have you been doing photography for? Well, I've been interested in it for quite some time now, but I only just started taking photography classes at the high school in my junior year, and I'm a senior now, so... Uh, can you talk about what motivated your work? Um, yeah, well, for this one, this one's part of a project that I'm doing um, about the public versus private selves, and um, for the project, I'm going to present the pictures as a diptych, but for the show, I just wanted it to be a standalone portrait because I thought that it was really strong, and I loved the light in it. And um, I thought that was just a really strong portrait. This picture actually was one of my dreams. And so this building is kind of like a virtual reality. And this circle is... I was going to put a moon behind the building, but I don't have time to create like a, a, an earth. It's actually an earth. And so this one, like, you can see that's a, actually a balloon. So it's a floating building. And you can only attend, like, enter into the building by this way. And it's breaking. There are four pieces here tonight. Excellent. Uh, can you tell us about your some of your pieces on display? Yeah, I got one right here. So it's uh, called Wild. It's a picture of... Um, uh, winter landscape. It's supposed to um, depict a traditional cut paper piece like this one over here. It's uh, but it's a digital piece, and I try to emulate that process digitally. That's what I focus on in my pieces. So that's what my theme is: focusing on uh, traditional pieces in a digital format. We got some over there, uh, movie poster, uh, a few others here. Yeah, so I have um, six pieces, I believe, and this one big one over here, which is my model that I created in my independent study, um, and a lot of them were projects that I did within class, um, and some of them were part of my independent study, which was a more like specified um, art class that I chose to do this year, since um, I'm going to college next year, and I really want to do architecture, so I wanted to do a class where I could focus on my love for architecture and kind of get a feel for it. In a lot of my work, I like to do a lot of detail drawing um, with uh, a lot of repetition, and I really like to use pen and ink as well. Um, this is my favorite medium, I think. I have six pieces in this show. Uh, how long have you been doing artwork for? Um, I will start doing art for in high school, so it's like two or three years. Excellent. Um, and uh, what are some of the pieces you have? Is there any around here? Um, this two sculpture is mine. Um, this is inspired by the Sigma building. I really like the color and the reflection of this big building. So I make some small things, like for example, it's a perfume bottom and a small sculpture. And uh, this is my sketchbook for my inspiration. A whole lot of programming is coming up on the HCAM channels. Here to tell you all about it is Matt Clark with our HCAM Insider. Hello everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the HCAM Insider. I'm Matt Clark, and here's what's happening this week on HCAM. On Friday, March 30th at 5 p.m., local artists gather to share their music and poetry in an open mic episode of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. 
And at 8 p.m., the Coffee Break hosts chat with Weston Nursery's owner Peter Mezzet on a new episode of the Hopkinton Coffee Break. On Monday, April 2nd at 6.30 p.m., Mary McLeod takes a look at the Bay Path Humane Society and the important work they do for the community on a new episode of Senior View. And at 8 p.m., Mary Arnott talks with Anne Matina of the Hopkinton Historical Society on a new episode of All About Hopkinton. On Tuesday, April 3rd at 5 p.m., the Hopkinton Board of Selectmen's meeting will air live on HKM TV. On Wednesday, April 4th at 7 p.m., Margie and Lisa are back and invite you to join the conversation on a new episode of The Margie and Lisa Show, live on HKM TV. Tune in and join the conversation. And on HKM Ed, the Hopkinton Public Safety Forum will air. If you want to know more about all of HKM shows before they air, then head over to hkm.tv slash connect, where you can sign up for our HKM Insider newsletter. Or if you want to know more about what's happening in Hopkinton, you can sign up for our daily news updates. That's all for this week's Insider. I'm Matt Clark, and as always, thanks for watching. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Matt. That will just about do it for this edition of HCAM News. Don't forget, you can stay up to date with everything Hopkinton by checking out our website, hcam.tv, as well as our Twitter and Facebook page. Be sure to head over to our website to take a look at upcoming events in town and the latest happenings throughout our community. If you have a Hopkinton-related video, photo, or story idea, I want to hear from you. Email me at news at hcam.tv. With your help, we'll cover even more of our community. For everyone here at HCAM, I'm Tom Nappy. We leave you now with the current community listings and upcoming government meetings. As always, thanks for watching HCAM News. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. On Saturday, March 17th, the Hopkinton Hillers girls basketball team ended their terrific season with a loss to Foxborough in the state championship at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield, Massachusetts by a final score of 49-41. to Foxborough captured their first state title in 23 years, while Hopkinton attempted to capture their first since 2001. Ivy Goglin put up a team-high 15 points and 11 rebounds for the Hillers, while Regan Caveney added 9 points and 5 rebounds.